Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 17th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also could follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why on fiscal matters, general bipartisanship isn't producing results at both the federal and state levels. Second, we discuss the concept of revenue design and why one of the objectives of the proposed anchored sales tax is a good thing from the perspective of fiscal policy. And third, a quote from one of the stories on Cook Inlet Gas summarizes the issue well. Someone should probably do something. We discuss who and what. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get cracking. Uh, you know, you got a, got a lot of big topics here today, and uh, and and some of it is uh, I just have to laugh at some of the some of the uh, the framing of some of the things that we're talking about. Specifically, uh, this morning, talking a little bit about uh, in number one bipartisanship versus the fiscal coalition, and this all kind of stems. Kelly Merrick had a had this wonderful opinion piece about how bipartisanship is so great. Uh, and it was so full of, um, well, there was a, there's a horse around here somewhere because she's there, there she's shoveling something a lot in this article, but, uh, I'll let you, I'll let you take a crack at it here and, uh, get started this morning. Well, Merrick did have an op-ed in the, um, uh, uh, in the Anchorage daily news that it was headlined bipartisanship produces results. Uh, Bill Wilikowski had something similar to it on his Facebook page. Kathy Giesel uh, had something similar to it on her Facebook page. And it wasn't just it wasn't just the Senate and it wasn't just the 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 the, the in the House. It wasn't just the minority, the House coalition. Justin Refridge had an op ed piece on his on uh, the Kenai. Uh, well, actually, it was an opinion. Uh, it was an interview. Refridge talked success, unfinished business after freshman uh, session in Juneau, and he talks about essentially achieving bipartisan results without without using the word. I'm reminded a lot, frankly, of something that I, that I learned uh, at the federal level, uh, sometimes working with the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Maya McGinnis is the head of the Committee for the Responsible Federal Budget. She's been uh, on the show with you talking about federal matters. And this is what we, and this is something she says about bipartisanship, the word bipartisanship at the federal level. It's a lot easier to compromise on things that are easier. Only where we get bipartisan compromise these days is where both parties get what they want and nobody pays for any of it. And so we end up borrowing more for it. In other words, bipartisanship is code word for Republicans and Democrats both get to spend on the things they want, Republicans on defense, Democrats on on uh, non-defense uh, on non-defense items, um, and they have a bipartisan compromise where they just keep spending more and more and more, uh, and nobody pays for nobody in the current generation pays for any of it. They just shove it off to future generations. In other words, in other words, bipartisanship means Republicans and Democrats get to spend, and the guy who pays for it is, or the person who pays for it is, the person that's not in the room. At the federal level, it's the, um, uh, the the future generations who are getting this massive federal debt piled on them. At the state level in Alaska, 
It's middle and lower income Alaska families who are, who are getting piled on, who are not in the room uh, as a, it, it, during the time that these deals are being made. Um, it's interesting to note that none of Merrick and none of Wilikowski's results, achieved results, mention anything about uh, uh, fiscal matters. Merrick's uh, a breakdown is fighting crime, expanding energy production, production, improving public schools, addressing workforce challenge, workforce challenges, improving health care. Uh, and that's that's her list of bipartisan achievements. Ruffridge is is focuses mostly on education. Wilikowski focused mostly on education. It's it's things that cost money. Uh, uh, education certainly K through twelve. We've increased spending for K through twelve. Uh, child improving health care, improving child care. Those are all places that that we've spent more money expanding energy production. We've now we're now going to subsidize producers in the cook inlet by at least by. Uh, floating loans to them, non essentially non-recourse loans, recourse back to us, uh, non-recourse loans, all these things that cost money, but none of them are listing any accomplishments on the on the fiscal side. Refrage claims, oh, we got a balanced budget, but balanced on who? It's balanced on the person who wasn't in the room. <laughs> on the permanent fund, right. I mean, it, here's the thing. Well, and Kelly Merrick's piece is, I mean, again, just, it just retreads some of the same old, uh, some of the same old stuff that you know we're, uh, you know we're 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 leaving the the flat funding on education and all this kind of stuff, and we're supporting employees by this, you know we passed the 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 uh, defined benefits plan, uh, which which ultimately died in the house, but it's it's protecting them and it's get, it's all it's all about the spend. It's just spending, spending, spending with no balancing act as to where the money's coming from. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. So, so bipartisanship. I mean, some people say, "Oh, the objective here is bipartisanship." Well, bipartisanship, as Maya said, bipartisanship is just a code word for we both get what we want, and we pile the cost onto somebody else who's 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 not in the room. So, I don't, I, you know, if somebody claims in Alaska that they that they're going to, you know, be part of a bipartisan coalition, or they're they're extolling their their achievements as a result of bipartisan cooperation. That's a code word for be very concerned because you're just what that is, is that both sides are getting what they want at the expense of at the expense of the person not in the room. So as we look around, as, as I've started to look around at candidates and to look at their uh, and to look at their you know websites and to look at their positions and their policies, um, it, it's it's I'm looking for people who are talking about fiscal matters but talking about it in a way that actually achieves results, actually produces something. A great example of that is, is David Nelson, who's going up against Cliff Grow. Um, and David Nelson's website, uh, when, he, when he talks about what he's planning to do or what his platform is, all Alaskans can count on me to, point number one, protect the PFD by putting it in a tough new spending cap in our Alaska constitution. I voted for the full PFD. 10 times, yet it remains a partisan football. And so that's the sort of thing, I mean, building around a, a coalition that may include Democrats, may include some Republicans, um, but but a coalition, that's the word at the federal level that, that Maya uses, and it's the word, I think, at the state level that I'm going to use when we talk about, you know, who's going to participate in achieving Fiscal sanity. Who's going to achieve? Who's going to? Who's going to participate in achieving fiscal reasonableness? It's not those who are claiming bipartisanship. Bipartisanship again is just a code word for we we get to spend on what we want. You get to spend on what you want. We pile the costs onto the person that's not in the room. Fiscal coalition to me means we're going to spend. Yes, but we're going to find a way to um, continue to spend. But we're going to find a way to pay for it in a way that uh, is has the lowest adverse impact on the Alaska economy and has the lowest adverse impact um, on Alaska families. And I think that's the, I think that's going to be a key distinction in this coming, in this coming election between people who are claiming that they're bipartisan and, and working toward bipartisan objectives and people who explicitly talk about uh, a fiscal coalition. Interestingly enough, you know, so I, so I, you know, I see this, I see this uh, uh, 
opinion piece by Merrick, and I thought, okay, what a great setup. Her, her She's got an opponent in that race. She's got several opponents in that race, but one of them is Jared Gecker that, that a lot of people talk about as being a great candidate and stuff. You go to his website, the word PFD doesn't appear. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's getting spending under, it's the old, it's the old, oh. the old uh, uh, claims of getting spending under control. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to get ourselves to a reasonable budget and, and, and that sort of stuff, but the word PFD doesn't appear. And so you sort of wonder, uh, you know, I've heard this, I've, I've got, I've gone down this road before uh, where people say, you know, I'm going to get spending under control. It doesn't happen. James Kaufman's a perfect example of that. Um, you know, James Kaufman went in and said, I'm going to get spending under control. I've got a spending cap. We're going to preserve the PFD. We're going to do all these other things. And then, you know, poof, it goes, it goes, disappears in the night. David Wilson from the Valley is another great one uh, on that. So, You've got to look at what these as what these positions are um, uh, when when the candidates come forward and say they're going to you know they're going to do great things. Bipartisanship's a code word for, by, but but at the end of the day, bipartisanship's a code word for. I'm going to spend, you're going to spend, we're all going to spend, um, uh, and, uh, and and we're going to go on down the road by piling the costs on on the person that's not in the room. And this seems to be the the buck passing thing. I mean, I I find it interesting that Gecker doesn't have the word PFD in there. And I wonder, is it because he doesn't want to paint himself into the corner when he knows that there's no fiscal will to get everything done? But sometimes you got to take a stand on stuff like that, right? If you won't pick your hand up to say, hey, I'm part of that crowd, then nobody else will. And then all of a sudden, it's just in the background and nobody's thinking about it, right? I mean, that's the thing. you got to point out where the problem is. And if you don't do that from the very beginning, you know, it, it's not like you're going to pop into it later. Uh, you know, when everybody else does, it's like somebody's waiting for somebody to take the first step. Yeah. I, I, how, how could you, how could you trust a candidate to deliver later when he won't even put it in his, put it, put it in his, uh, put it in his platform when he, when he's running yeah. for office. I mean, Jeremy Bynum down in the, down in the Southeast, another one endorsed by the Alaska. It, you got to have the list of the Alaskans for prosperity, you know, action, action or whatever the heck it is that they call themselves and the candidates they've divorced, uh, the candidates they've endorsed. It's a mixed bag in terms of, in terms of fiscal matters. Jeremy Bynum uh, down in the Southeast has ha on his website has, he's going to protect the permanent fund. That's not the same thing. Right. Protecting As the permanent for, fund and the dividend are two separate things at this point. Right. It, uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, you're going to protect the permanent fund because you want to continue to spend it. Uh, what about the PFD? What about, you know, protecting the portion that, that goes to, goes to Alaska families. And so. But the same it, thing. It's the same thing with, with, with uh, Hidukovic. It's the same thing because we had her on the program and she would not come outright and say that she is for protecting the PFD. Cause again, she's concerned. I mean, she's going to, she's a more moderate Republican in that regard. Um, she got a little bit of an eye opening when she came on the program and got interviewed here, because I think it really showed her that there's a class of folks out there in our listeners and in kind of more on the conservative side, the smaller government side that may not necessarily line up with what she's got, but she still got the Americans for prosperity, Alaska endorsement. So, I mean, I guess there wasn't really another choice in that race because it was her or Kawasaki. So uh, some of these races are pivotal and they may move the needle, just maybe not as far as we want. I guess, Michael, I, 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 to me, you know, we ought to focus on the races that do move the needle. I, we ought not to just endorse another, uh, well, she's not as bad as he is uh, uh, type of race. If they're, if they're not moving the needle forward, yeah, she may win, he may win, but you know, but they're not moving the needle forward. You, you want people, you know, just based on the website, you want people like David Nelson, who's going to, you know, move the needle forward, needle forward. You want people like Ben Carpenter who are going to move the needle forward. You want to, you, you want, you want to find people who are saying this is an issue, fairness to Alaskans, fairness to Alaska families, prioritizing the overall Alaska economy is an issue and i'm gonna and i'm gonna you know stand for that issue and i'm gonna stand for uh the pfd and and cut, cutting spending is one way to do it finding alternative revenues is another way to do it but that's that's you know that's a poll i'm putting in the i'm putting in the ground that's a stake i'm putting in the ground that i'm going to stand on and that and and we ought to find people like that and build a coalition and I, there's some people on the Democrat side that are going to say that there, right. there's you got to find people like that. They're willing to put a stake in the ground for the PFD 
and then build around that coalition, not bipartisanship, not right. that not not that old word, but 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 find well, people who are willing to be part of a coalition. The problem is, is that they've changed the word bipartisanship to mean something that it doesn't, right? I mean, it's not just working together. Like you said, it's working together to spend more to have somebody else pay for it. That's the the definition of the word has changed. Bipartisanship in and of itself, not a bad thing. But when the way they use it today, it's that changing of the vocabulary and the changing of the language, and they've changed the definition of it for sure. Kevin says, moving the needle forward has to start with getting to a majority so you can drive the bus and assign committee chairs. I mean, I would agree with that. Um, you know, I think, again, that's probably what the endorsement for Hajdukovic is, is getting Kawasaki out to help move the needle on that uh, majority in the Senate. Audrey in Fairbanks says the same thing. We have to get Kawasaki out. Leslie's knocking door to door and asking people what they want. So we need to be ready to tell her. And I think that's what we tried to do on the program when we had her on. She was a little, she was a little, uh, not overwhelmed, but a little surprised, I think, by the reaction from some of the things and some of the questions that we had, uh, uh, we had on it. Um, what day did you interview Leslie on your show? I, I'll have, I'd have to go back and look. You can go back and look at my SoundCloud uh, file where all my podcasts are and you could search through there. It was two months ago, three months ago. We had, uh, we had, uh, Leslie on the program. Um, but I mean, again, Brad, bipartisanship, the true definition is not necessarily a bad thing. The thing is, is now it's being used as code for, we got what we want. And everybody, you know, and basically it's a brag list. That's what this bipartisan, you know, thing is. I mean, the thing with Kelly Merrick, it was essentially a brag list. Look at all we did and we could do more if we could only get more people into our team of spend more. Uh, that's that seems to be the answer. Yeah, I I, I agree with that, Michael. I, you know, um, I think Maya just has it right uh, that bipartisanship has become this code word for you get you will spend on what you want as long as you agree to spend on what I want, uh, and um, and we'll just stuff the cost to the guy who's not in the room at the federal level. It's the um, it's future generations uh, who are going to pay for it through accumulating debt, and at the state level, at least in Alaska, it's middle and lower income Alaska you know families who are going to pay for it through PFD cuts. Let me go, Kevin. Kevin raises a point. I've heard this point before. I understand the point about about chairmanships you know being important and so you vote for the party in order so you get chairmanship but delena johnson what we got in the finance committee come on what we got in the finance committee was co-chairs out of the majority was bryce edgman J delena johnson and and neil foster and they produced a budget you know claimed success at producing a budget that was financed on the back of middle and lower income alaska families through deep pfd cuts so <laughs> Okay, you know, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, we got we got a majority, but the majority isn't producing. So when the majority doesn't produce, uh, what do you do? I mean, when the majority just ends up being another form of coalition um, uh, that that agrees to spend, uh, you know, Delana Delana claims success off this off this last legislature. You know, we we came to agreement, we did things. Julie Colomb got her child care tax credit through, you know, we extended the education tax credit, which is another one of Justin Ruffridge's claims, tax credits being, you know, code word for more spending that's outsourced through, a, through corporations. Um, you know, we claim, we claim we got all these successes, but the successes came at the expense of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. They came at the expense of the overall Alaska economy through PFD cuts. So, okay. But, but, you know, if, when the majority doesn't produce, when you get all these committee chairmanships and the majority doesn't produce, you know, fiscally responsible results, what the heck are you going to do? It's, it's, yeah. you fool yeah. me once, fool me 20 times. Do I, do I finally, yeah. you know, see, see another, see another path? Yeah, no, I agree. I guess it was a while ago. It was actually back in January. I posted a link to the Leslie Hajdukovic interview uh, there in the chat room. People can see it. Ron says, all of those trying to build the size of government want to save and even build the permanent fund. They never say they will protect the dividend. There is a big difference. Yeah. And that's the truth, because that goes back to that $100 billion mark that they want for the permanent fund, right? Because then it just spins off money for government every year, every year, and they don't have to worry about it. That's why they were trying to push all that money into the uh, into the uh, uh, corpus of the fund and take it out of the earnings reserve. It was a twofer. They got to create the crisis and they got to push that that money up to the 
hundred billion dollar mark, which is what they want to keep government running. Forget about what happens to the private economy. I mean, private economy, pff, what's that? We're continuing on here. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. We continue now going over these things. Let's talk a little bit about number two, which is how revenue design works. Brad, you've got thoughts on this. Revenue design, how does it work? What uh, what, what are you talking about here? Well, the Alaska or the Anchorage sales tax is, is the example that I've picked, probably not the world's best example, but the example that I've picked, and I've got the world's best example that'll come up after I talk about the Anchorage sales tax. But the Anchorage sales tax is an example, a partial example of revenue design. Revenue design is, is you're not increasing revenues, which is why the, the Anchorage sales tax isn't the perfect example, but, but you're redesigning the way you get revenues. Something like two thirds uh, of the, oh, 80% of the revenue, two thirds of the revenue uh, that is going to come from the, the, from the proposed, it's proposed that the uh, uh, two thirds of the revenue that's gonna come from the proposed uh, Anchorage sales tax. There, I got all the proposed in there. Uh, the two thirds of the revenue that's gonna come from that is, is going to be used to reduce property taxes. And so what you're having is, is one set of revenues replacing another set of revenues. And sales taxes, while they're not, certainly not the least regressive, they are less regressive and in that way more pro-economy uh, than property taxes. And so you are going to, what the, what the Anchorage sales tax is doing in part is proposing to is to replace one set of revenues that you're going to get that are regressive property taxes and replace that with a less regressive uh, uh, set of, of, of taxes, at least with that share of the income, uh, less regressive set of taxes in, in the form of sales taxes. The other thing about sales taxes is they will tap into the tourist market in a deeper way, non-resident market, if you will, non-resident revenue source in a deeper way than do property taxes. Certainly we have non-residents who own property in the state in, in Anchorage, and certainly that they are paying a share of the property taxes, but the share paid by non-residents will increase by moving to sales taxes for that share of revenue uh, instead of property taxes. So the point is taxes, a tax proposal isn't always about increasing revenues a tax proposal is to is to change the way in which we get the same amount of revenue and do it in a better way do it in a less regressive or in a more expansive and more broad based in the sense that you're getting non-residents uh increasing the non-resident share and it's good when you do that it's good when you replace one revenue source with another revenue source that is a better revenue source. There's also an advantage. I mean, most tax experts will tell you that you want to diversify your tax base so that if one portion of the tax base gets hit by a depression or gets hit by falling values, that that you have a different set of uh, a, a different portion of the tax base that may be staying stable or increasing at the time. We do this, we do this with oil taxes. One of the reasons that the corporate tax the petroleum ta the corporate the tax on petroleum corporations is so important and 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 why i you know complain about the hillcorp loophole so much is it's a diversification of the of the petroleum tax base it's a it's a way of gathering a share of income uh that is separate and apart from you know being dependent on oil prices or being dependent uh on royalties or being dependent on production volumes you sort of get that you sort of get that money in a different way. And so you diversify your tax base and protect yourself, hedge against, against, uh, against bad outcomes in one area. So the, the Anchorage sales tax, I mean, the, you shouldn't, people shouldn't have an immediate re urge, allergic reaction to talking about a sales tax to the extent it's being used to replace a worse source of revenue. Now, the problem with the Anchorage sales tax is two thirds of it's going to go to replace property tax, but enough that the other third of it is going to go to increase spending. Right. And, and, and so, yes, it's bad in the sense 
that is going to be generating revenue for additional spending. But, but you know, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't think that all taxes are bad because a portion of the Anchorage sales tax is going to be used uh, to, to increase spending. Focus just for a moment. I mean, just before you throw out the baby, focus on the fact that two thirds of it is going to be used to replace a, a less, a, a, a less beneficial revenue source. Another example of this and the much better example of revenue design is Ben Carpenter's sales tax that he proposed uh, in the last legislature uh, and uh, as a ways and means bill and never got out of the ways and means committee. It was exactly the same thing, except it was better. <laughs> it was a sales tax uh, and what he proposed to do with it uh, was to take the revenues from the sales tax and re and reduce the corporate income tax. In other words, supplant the corporate income tax, uh, a portion of the corporate income tax. We have one of the highest corp in Alaska. We have one of the highest corporate income tax rates in the nation. Um, and and what he was going to do was reduce that corporate tax rate, pay to reduce that corporate tax rate down to a much more competitive level, and try to use it as a tool to attract additional corporate corporations uh, uh, for operations uh, in the state. And the other portion of it, that was about, that was a, again, about a third of it was going to go to reduce the corporate income tax. The other two thirds was going to go to reduce the PFD, was going to replace uh, the PFD. So some people are going to say, well, Ben Ben Carpenter was in favor of a sales tax. No, he was in favor of revenue, of redoing the revenue design that we've currently got that is hugely regressive works against the interests of the overall Alaska economy uh, by taking money out of the pockets of, of Alaskans only did not, does not collect anything from non res The current revenue system doesn't collect anything from non residents. He was going to take the revenues not to increase spending, but to re but to, but to supplant replace uh, uh, existing revenue sources that are worse. Uh, he was going to use it. He, he proposed to use it to, to redesign revenues. So the, the, when we have these allergic reactions to, to taxes, think for a moment about what they're about the purpose they're being used for. Not all taxes are being used to increase spending. Some taxes are being used to replace other taxes right. that are that are worse, that have larger right. adverse impacts on the on the economy and on families. Well, and I think, you know, starting off with the anchor sales tax is definitely some problems there. I mean, first and foremost, it's an overall increase in the taxation, uh, although it drops the taxation on property owners by whatever it was, a thousand bucks. The overall spend was an, an additional two hundred and fifty dollars on households. And so when it's all said and done, it's a net net in the in the long run. And. What we've discovered in the past when people try and take a, pro a sales tax and say that it's going to offset property tax, it does in the short term, but in the long term, historically, you end up with both going on and both going forward and both increasing. In fact, the example that they used, which was Oklahoma City, where they said they had a temporary sales tax. If you look at it today, that was in the 90s, they said we used Oklahoma City as an example. Today, Oklahoma City has a permanent sales tax of 5%. So 4.8% 4. 4. or whatever it is, plus the state sales tax and everything else. So, I mean, uh, you're right. We need to look at it, you know, each individually and each thing in isolation. But we also need to look at what historically has happened in those regards as well. Michael, I don't I don't disagree with that. And certainly, certainly we don't want to be increasing revenue with taxes. But But to have this allergic reaction to say taxes are bad, period, end of discussion, end of sentence. That's that's counterproductive because we already have taxes and we're going to continue to have taxes. We're going to continue to have, if we don't have an alternative source of revenue, a lower impact alternative source of revenue, we're going to continue to have PFD cuts, which are the ones that have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and have the largest adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. We're going to continue to have taxes. So to have it, it, it's not helpful to just immediately have an allergic reaction to, to, to the time it, it, to anybody who says taxes. You've got to look at what the tax does. And I agree that, that, that the Anchorage sales tax has a component in it, a third of it, 
is going to be used to increase spending. I agree with that, but but let's focus on the fact that two thirds of it. And I'm not I'm not saying I support the Anchorage sales tax, but I'm saying let's look at it before we before we just you know toss it out the window. Two thirds of it is being used to reduce a worse tax. Um, and and you know people will say, oh well we'll just we'll just reduce it. What we ought to do is reduce spending. Well, it doesn't happen. And what happens as a consequence is we continue spending funded by the worst tax, funded by those who you know claim bipartisanship, right? Uh, in 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 agreeing to the spending funded by the worst tax. So so we've got to we've we've got to be smart enough that when somebody says tax, we just don't say ah no. We've got to be smart enough that when somebody says tax, okay, what do you what do you what are you going to use it for? And right. if it's used for revenue design, if it's used for revenue redesign to reduce the burden or to spread the burden, as as would be the case with the sales tax, because of the pickup uh, that it has with respect to non-residents, to, to, to spread the burden out so that the burden is not entirely concentrated as it is through PFD cuts on Alaska families. It, it's it's when, when somebody says, you know, we're going to have a tax that does that that replaces other sources of revenue with better, less impactful, less bad sources of revenue. We, we were smart enough to, to realize that and we're smart enough to support that. And I just, I, it, it, the Anchorage sales tax is an imperfect example because a third of it's being used to increase spending, but, it, but, but, but it's useful to understand that at least a portion of it would be used for revenue redesign. I agree with what you're saying. We have to take each piece in isolation and look at each piece on its merits. Um, but again, my fear has always been, even when we've talked about an income tax or anything else, is that uh, without something like a spending cap, that they will just take that money and then add to it and then take the other money anyway. It has to, again, it has to be a full fiscal uh, plan that includes that spending cap because otherwise it'll be just like Anchorage is doing. We're going to change it. We're going to change it. You're, we're going to take away that bad tax of the property tax, which I agree with is probably one of the most evil taxes that I can think of. We're going to place it all on the sales tax on the consumption side. We're going to overall increase the actual number of taxes. Now we're going to spread it differently. Oh, and we're going to use a third of it to build more. And and that's that's the problem, right? I mean, that's why the spending cap is so important. Yeah, I agree, Michael. I mean, David Nelson, I mean, to go back to Go back to a candidate who's got at least, you know, at least his positions uh, are right. David Nelson says that um, protect the PFD. All Alaskans can count on me to protect the PFD by putting it and a tough new spending cap in our Alaska Constitution. I agree that they go hand in hand, but but it just it it I mean, people who hear the word tax and just explode uh, are part of the problem. They're not part of the solution. Because we've got taxes, we've got a tax in the form of, of, of the PFD tax, which, you know, ISA professor, longtime ISA professor Matt Berman says is the most regress, re, regressive tax ever proposed. We've got taxes. We're not going to get away from taxes. The question now is, what's the lowest impact tax? And it's one that spreads the burden broadly so that the each individual piece of it is, is low and one that spreads it relatively evenly across as a share of income as, across uh, all Alaska families. And also, you know, to, to sort of get ahead of Air Herald for a change, uh, also includes oil companies who, who are not contributing. You know, we don't have the oil tax rates set at the, at the, at the max, maximizing revenue, at the revenue maximizing level from, from oil companies. But, but we've got to, we, we, we've got to get away from, this sort of this sort of you know knee jerk reaction of taxes bad I oppose it because we've already got taxes. The question now is we've got evil. What's the what's the least evil in the world uh, that that we can that we can do, and and finding finding ways to broaden the base to include non residents and uh, and equalizing the the impact across the uh, income brackets is is what you search for. You and Chris agree, taxes are evil. But all, I mean, again, what is the lesser of all evils in the long run? I mean, that that's you know, 
I, I agree. And look, I don't I don't immediately shy away from the idea of taxes. I, I agree that it has to be addressed and at least analyzed because otherwise and this is what I've said for a long time uh, that, you know, people are like, oh, I can't believe you talk about taxes on your show. Well, if we don't talk about it, first of all, we're already facing it. We just don't know. It's a stealth tax that we're really it's just not labeled as a tax. But Berman at ICER and others have said, well, it is a tax, the most regressive one you can get. And then secondly, if we don't talk about it, if we don't talk about the intricacies of it and what the ramifications are of it, it'll just sneak up on us and club us in the face anyway. They'll just bring it up and the next thing you know, it'll be there. And because we refuse to talk about it, we will have no input on how it's implemented or whether or not it works. That's the problem. Yep. Yep. Hol holding your breath and saying no taxes, no taxes, no taxes is is it is it, it, the the upper income and the and the oil companies the non-resident industries all love that because they're getting away with murder they're getting away with pushing the burden the tax burden down on middle and lower income alaska families they're pushing they're you're getting away with pushing the burden down on the the source that has the largest adverse impact on the on the oil on the overall alaska economy they don't have to pay it because of the way it's structured they don't have to pay it. So they love these people. They love these people that go, you know, hold their breath and go, no taxes, no taxes, no taxes, because they're continue. Then they, then they get to continue using PFD cuts, largest adverse impact, most regressive tax ever proposed. They continue to get, they continue to use PFD cuts to, to fund government in Anchorage, set aside the fact that a third of it's going to be used to increase spending in Anchorage. You know, the, the the tourist industry loves the property tax because they don't pay it. They don't pay they don't pay the sh near near the share. They don't accept near the burden that they will out of a sales tax. So it's think about think about when you talk about taxes, think about who's getting away with not paying that particular tax. And and are you okay with that? Welcome back to Michael Duke Show, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. The weekly top three continues. We're on to number three, fastest two hours in radio. It's amazing. Number three is all about the Cook Inlet. Somebody should probably do something is the answer. I mean, you know, oh, we've got all this 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 hand wringing and, and pearl clutching going on by certain members of the legislature and of the utilities. Uh, my favorite comment so far today has been from... Um, uh, has been from Kelly Merrick, where she talks about her energy production, expanding energy production. And uh, she says, together, these bills, the bills that they tried to work on in the legislature, will enable our utilities to build out more affordable energy produced in Alaska, rather than becoming dependent on expensive imported LNG. I mean, there it is. No, I mean, not that if we don't if we if the state if the state pays for it, it's going to be more expensive. It'll just all be hidden costs. Don't worry about it. I mean, in the long run, I mean, it, it, somebody should do something, Brad. Somebody <laughs> should do something. Well, that actually is a sentence. Some something should probably somebody should probably do something. Is a quote from what I think is a great article about the about the Cook Inlet ener energy crisis. There's a there's a blog called for those of you who don't follow it. There's a blog called the Alaska Energy Blog. It's written by uh, a woman by the name of Erin McKittrick, who's in Seldovia of all places, uh, but who also sits on the Homer Electric Association uh, board. the The title of the article it's it's dated June fourth. The title of the article is "Why Are the Warnings About Cook Inlet in Inlet Gas Getting More Dire?" And it's a great it goes through a great list of or great explanation of how we got into this situation. What what's the situation we're in? And what all the what are the alternatives for getting out of it? And like everybody else who seriously looks at the issue, as opposed to John Sims, everybody else who seriously looks at the issue, you figure out quickly. Wait, you know, focusing on 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 you know spending state money to develop more Cook Inlet gas through subsidies or through subsidies of various forms is 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 a dead end proposition because it's only going to get you a, a small amount of gas over a short term and it's going to be more expensive than the alternative of importing other US gas. Remember, the US is the largest LNG exporter in the world, the largest source of LNG on the water in the world. So Alaska sources would just look like 
likely come from from other sources in the U.S. It's not like we're talking about Russian gas. We're talking about other U.S. gas. And and so, you know, like everybody else, Aaron goes through this uh, analysis and says, yeah, we need to be talking about LNG. We need to be getting on uh, with LNG and we need to do some other things, renewables and, and so forth. But we need to be getting on with with LNG. And, and she, like us on the show, just don't un- there's she explains there's no clear reason or there's no clear understanding of why the utilities aren't moving forward on on an LNG project and when they do move forward they move forward on a on a greenfield one at Port McKenzie that requires the construction of a new LNG plant requires the construction of new pipelines and probably is going to mean a major adjust, adjustment to the to the NSTAR system because they've never gotten gas from that particular source, that particular direction before. Um, when when we've got, you know, in, instead of pursuing the existing Kenai LNG plant that Marathon owns, has been talking about turning around, has, has approvals, at least partially to turn it around. Um, and and exist right by right by existing LN or NSTAR lines that, that go by it. Aaron's the 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 quote at the at, at the paragraph or at the section that says in conclusion the first line is somebody should probably do something somebody should probably go forward and get started on the process of getting essentially LNG in place um, to 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 meet the long terms the the short even the intermediate and long term needs uh, of the of the Cook Inlet yet nobody's doing it and the people that you would think would be doing it. Uh, are NSTAR or the electric utilities that use gas as a fuel source uh, to generate electricity, but nobody's doing it. And and the and the problem is the longer we don't do it, the 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 more behind the curve we're putting ourselves down the road in having that alternative source ready to go uh, when uh, when Cook Inlet declines uh, 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 kick in to the point that that you need to have uh, need to have LNG. Uh, Aaron points out, and I think I think correctly so, there are alternative LNG sources, but they're a hell than than you know using an LNG plant like Kenai LNG. There are are alternative LNG sources that are a lot more expensive. Uh, short cylinders that you put on barges and bring up and and unload LNG, hugely expensive uh, on a, on a on a per unit basis compared to large scale LNG. These, these cylinders are hugely expensive, but but they're short-term solutions. And Aaron's point is the longer we put off developing the LNG facility, the long-term intermediate and long-term LNG facility, the more dependent we're going to be on these barge sources uh, for uh, uh, for imported for bringing in LNG um, uh, in the meantime as we as we as the Cook Inlet winds down, and and so it's. It's it's you know somebody should do something about the long term. To me, the 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 person not or the agency or the entity not being discussed that should be discussed at the center of this is the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, who has the obligation to supervise the utilities in their performance of their of their obligations. And one of the obligations of the utilities is to have is to is to be able to provide adequate service and one of the obligations one of the tenets of uh, providing a, a adequate service is to have a gas supply is to have an energy supply to be able to provide service the utilities have that obligation it's part of their certificated obligations the RCA the regulatory commission of Alaska has the jurisdiction and the authority and the responsibility to overlook the utilities in 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 their in their performance of that obligation, if utility is not living up to the standard of the obligation to serve, it's, it's the obligation of the RCA to step in and and tell the utility to do it, or to find the utility, or to do whatever it takes to motivate the utility to to meet the obligation. So when we talk about someone should probably do something, it should be the RCA that, in the absence of the utility stepping up, it should be the RCA that steps up and says, "What are you doing about this situation?" Um, and and if you're not doing something that that ensures low cost, reliable service to Alaskans, 
uh, then then you need to get on with it or we're going to do things in our regulatory power to uh, to ensure you do. It was interesting because Aaron's article, which I've posted up in the chat room for folks who want to read it, um, goes on and it actually lays out it. She said the timeline says something along the lines of the timeline of this is very confusing because they've said stuff all over the place. And she actually documents out the timeline to show you. And it just seems to me that this, again, kind of hyper uh, focuses on the fact that this is like <clears throat> they're trying to create the crisis to force the issue and, and things like that. Uh, because they've kind of been all over the place. This essentially, again, appears to, again, to me as a layman, uh, not understanding every intricacy of all these issues, that literally what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the state to pay for a big chunk of this so that one, they don't have to, and two, that everybody's everybody feeds at the trough, so to speak, uh, and everybody gets their cake and eat it too, instead of uh, having this other option out there. Yeah, it's uniquely Alaskan. I mean, I, we, we've been through this. I've, I've been through this over my career in Louisiana. I've been through it in Oklahoma. I've been through it in Texas. Nobody ever thinks about going to the state to getting the state to pay for it because the utilities, private companies, as part of their certificate, as part of their as part of their monopoly power, as part of their certificate of, of convenience and necessity that gives them a monopoly over the service area, as part of that, they have the obligation to go do it, to go get the supply, to make the decisions to get adequate supply. No one ever thinks about, oh, state bail me out, you know, give me money um, uh, or subsidize the producers or, or do something to save me from myself. It's, it's up to the utilities. They have the obligation to do it, to go do it. And the utilities go do it. And if they don't go do, go do it, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission in the case of Oklahoma, the Texas Public Utilities Commission or the Railroad Commission uh, in the case of Texas, the Louisiana Public Service Commission in the case of Louisiana, Mississippi Public Service Commission, all come in and, and intervene and say, look, why aren't you doing this? Hold hearings. Why aren't you doing this? And if you're not, if you're not going to do it, then are you putting yourself in violation of your obligation to serve, of your certificate obligation to serve? They all do. no, and and the and the response isn't. Oh, let's go to the legislature and get ourselves bailed out of this. That that isn't that isn't the reaction. The reaction is yes, sir. Understand, I've got the obligation to do it. I'll start making the investments to be able to do it. NSTAR, NSTAR at least appears on the surface to be trying to skip out of that and say, oh, it's not our obligation. Yeah, yeah, I know you gave us a monopoly, but yeah, yeah, it's not our obligation. It's the obligation of the state to go subsidize us somehow. And it's just, I, it's just. I mean, we're going down a rat hole, uh, and uh, and in the meantime, the situation is getting worse and worse. And the, the situation in terms of the lead time, the, the the time before which we can have the solution in place, is getting longer. This by by inaction in the mean in the meantime, the the time by which we have the solution in place is getting longer and farther and farther and farther away. So somebody uh, somebody should probably do something. It should be the RCA that starts doing something. Somebody's got to get up off their rusty dusty. Otherwise, we're going to be facing a real crisis when the time crunch comes. Did you get an invite to, to testify in front of the RCA? Um, or was uh, it? No, they have a public comment period. So I took took an opportunity yeah. for public comment period to comment. Yeah. I would love to have been a fly on the wall to watch the reactions uh, from that. Because basically when you said, hey, this is your job, you need to step up and do it. Um, you know, this idea that somehow... And again, this emotional idea that somehow we have to have Alaskan gas to be able to survive or, you know, or somehow we failed if we can't use Alaskan gas. We failed as a state. We failed as a people if we don't have Alaskan gas. It, sometimes it's just the economics of it. I mean, if it's stranded gas and you can't get to it, that's not necessarily your fault. I mean, that's not, that's not how it works. And if it's cheaper in the long run or in the short run even to import, why aren't we at least, I mean, why don't we at least have a plan B, right, Brad? And it's not like they're even going with a good plan B. They're going to McKenzie and want to build a whole new plant instead of going to the Kenai where there's a plant already built. And all they got to do is reverse everything and turn the spigots on. It's like their plan B is really a plan Z or something. I mean, they're way down on the thing. They're not even talking about it. Well, plan B, I mean, I I, I, I think I'm coming to the conclusion that their plan B of going to McKenzie is, is a plan to, to look so bad <laughs> that that you've got to that you've got to double down on plan A that you've got to you know you've got to you've got to make these subsidies to the Cook Inlet 
uh, because plan B is just so expensive and so, you know, off the charts in terms of, in terms of, you know, additional permitting and all sorts of things that you've got to run through uh, that you'll never get it done. So, so we've got to go to plan A. I think that's what plan B is. I think it's intentional failure uh, or intentional difficulty in order to, in order to keep diverting people back to, back to plan A. But the problem is, I mean, as Aaron points out, as every other person who has looked at this seriously points out, it, it, plan A is, 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 is at best a short-term plan in terms of production levels, in terms of volumes, and it's more costly. I mean, that's what the, that's what the utility report, uh, last year's utility report, uh, can the consultants report hired by the utility said that it's more costly to develop additional cook inlet supplies than it is to bring in, um, uh, LNG. And so it's just, I, you know, we talked on last week's show why NSTAR might be motivated to, to do this. One is they want to keep prices low in order to preserve demand. If higher pri- if prices go up, as they're going to be from the cook, as they would be any in any event, regardless from the cook inlet or from other sources, prices go up. There's going to be a, a response, a, supply, a demand response, and, and, and demand will go down. And two, they're trying to avoid having to invest themselves. Um, uh, if, the, if the state will subsidize cook inlet production down to levels that, you know, NSTAR buys it, then NSTAR is able to put off uh, investing in the kit necessary to bring in lower cost supplies. It, at some point, Michael, oh, this is, this is going to get me bad, bad, bad messages. But at some point, you begin to wonder whether NSTAR isn't putting itself at risk down the road if, if you know, if they put off developing alternative sources of supply through LNG. If they keep putting that off and down the road, we have to pay these exorbitant supplies for bringing in LNG by cylinder. You you begin to wonder whether the RCA at that point shouldn't be penalizing penalizing NSTAR by saying you can't recover all those those costs because you, your failure to plan, your failure to put in place alternative, alternative sources, lower cost sources, has put us at the cost of these additional of these LNG by cylinder uh, supplies, LN, LNG on barge uh, supplies, and so you know I, I think it's short sighted of, of NSTAR not to be not to be progressing forward uh, publicly with a doable low cost LNG supply as opposed to as opposed to what's going on at Port McKenzie or their proposal for Port McKenzie. Uh, Kevin says Port Mac could quote provide rail transport cheaper than pipe to fairbanks well sure i mean and if i had a, a gazillion dollars i could divide i could probably design a plane that would ha- ha- you know haul lng to fairbanks i mean yes it could it could except it's not there and and all the stuff in the kenai is there it's i mean like i said all they got to do is reverse everything instead of export make it import they've got some of the permits they're already well ahead they've got the storage they're ready to go i mean or we could build a whole plant from scratch fight about <laughs> how we're going to connect a rail line to it from port mac i mean i'm not saying it wouldn't be a good thing to have that i'm saying it's not the solution especially as they continue to shrink the window down to say oh it's 2030 oh it's 2029 oh it's 2027 oh it's 2025 i mean they're you know continuing to try and put pressure on this to create this crisis i mean that's the problem why do we ignore and and you might be right maybe this is all part of the plan to create a plan b that looks so bad and so iffy that we've got to go with this uh this other this this plan a option that that is that, that doubles down on it it's uh, I mean, it's it's crazy stuff. Yes, you're right. If we had a port Mac already, if we had a rail already, if we had all those things already, it would make sense. But we you don't. Know the, you know what the permitting problems were go- are going to be of building a grassroots LNG facility at at Port McKenzie. It's just, I mean, it's going to be huge. What, Alaska is has one of the benefits of the existing oil and gas structure that we build up in the state is that we have existing facilities. We have an existing Kenai LNG plant bought by Marathon. I, I it is beyond me why why we don't hear Marathon LNG as as part of this discussion. Why we're why we're talking about all these grassroots this new grassroots facility. That's just 
as as Aaron says, somebody should probably do something. Well, yes, somebody should. <laughs> RCA, if you're listening, you should be the one that starts doing something here. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Brad, we got to go. Thank you so much for coming on board. Appreciate the call uh, and uh, being part of it today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.